Rubel from the National Museum of American Jewish Military History. Uh, here we at the museum, we tell the story of Jews serving in the American military, and, and people hear Jews in military, and they often go uh, right to Israel, and they assume, you know, what we covered is, is uh, around Israel and the IDF. Uh, so this is one of the places where it comes together. These World War II veterans who went to Israel in 48, fought for Israeli independence. And we certainly uh, love exploring the way World War II influenced people's lives for veterans after the war and for these groups that went to Israel in 48. They're just remarkable stories. So it's a real pleasure to have Jeff Weiss here, the author of Fighting Back, tells the story of Stan Andrews, a guy who really had a, a remarkable life story and an interesting path, different than, than a lot of these other guys. Uh, Jeff Weiss is the co-author of I Am My Brother's Keeper, which tells the story of American and Canadian volunteers in all branches of the Israeli Defense Forces during the 1948 War of Independence. Jeff is featured in the 2014 Nancy Spielberg documentary Above and Beyond about American members of the Israeli Air Force in 1948, which received 22 film awards. He also appeared in the 2000 documentary Israel's Forgotten Heroes, narrated by Hal Linden. He's fluent in Hebrew, having completed a year of law school at bar Ilan University. In addition to a law degree, Jeff holds a master's degree in international law and in biotechnology, and has been writing on Middle East security for more than 20 years. He's passionate about fitness and is an ultra marathoner and two-time Ironman. I just learned he was running for what was six hours this morning? All right. So welcome, Jeff Weiss. Thank you very much. I'll wait for that uh, for that first slide to come up. So basically, so our book Fighting Back uh, is about uh, this really fascinating uh, American Jew named Stan Andrews. And my goal uh, in today's talk is to try to explain who he was and to in the process, perhaps uh, help folks understand why uh, my brother Craig and I spent so many years chasing after uh, Stan's, uh, Stan's story. Uh, next slide, please. Um, our first book, I'm a Brother's Keeper, uh, we wrote uh, in, in uh, basically between 1995, uh, 1998. It came out in 1998 in time for Israel's 50th anniversary. And our goal in that book was to tell the story of the 1,000 or so um, North Americans who went to Israel uh, as volunteers to fight in the War of Independence. Um, in the course of that research, we came across uh, Stan Andrews and his particular story and um, didn't learn all that much about him, but enough to really uh, become intrigued by him. But our goal in the book was really to tell the much larger story. And so we basically made a commitment to ourselves that after the first book was done and out, um, we would later go back and do more research, see if we could track down Stan's family and really focus in on his story. Um, some of you may have seen Nancy Spielberg's uh, documentary, um, uh, which came out in 2014. She did an absolutely wonderful job telling the story about a group of uh, four particular uh, volunteers uh, in the Air Force. And that's where the, the North Americans made their greatest impact. And it wasn't the only place. Of course, Mickey Marcus is the most famous of the volunteers. He was the first general in the Israeli army uh, and uh, um, and was killed uh, about a month uh, into the fighting. Paul Shulman, a, a, an Annapolis graduate, was the first commander of the Israeli Navy. Um, but the Air Force really was where most of the contributions were made. So this uh, this is uh, Stan. So Stan was born in New York, uh, uh, quite, uh, quite literally a, a beautiful uh, child. His mother... Uh, entered a, a baby picture of of him into a beautiful uh, child con contest when he was already uh, a young teenager, and to his uh, uh, great embarrassment, the, the picture won. Um, and so, uh, so he was uh, he was handsome. He was a brilliant student, and also, um, next slide, an extraordinarily talented artist. Um, and Stan liked uh, all kinds of art. Uh, this was a uh, a realistic uh, portrayal, obviously very Norman uh, Rockwell esque. Uh, and then um, this is Stan in an art class uh, during college at City College of New York, working with uh, with clay. And then the next one is uh, is an abstract piece uh, called Mad Mad Surgery um, that Stan um, that Stan also did. 
so basically Stan, like, like so many young Americans at the time saw that, um, he would end up in the military and he wanted to uh, become uh, a pilot. And in particular, he wanted to become a fighter pilot. Now, Stan's name at birth was uh, Stanley Annexstein. And he became concerned that with a last name like Annexstein, he might be kept from fighter pilot training. And so he decided after graduating from high school that he would change his name and he changed it to Stan Andrews. Um, and so he went ahead and he enlisted. This is actually a picture of him at the end of his service, but you can get a sense of what he looked like at the time. Um, and he actually uh, completed his service as a captain. Uh, and in fact, at the time, one of the youngest captains in the entire US Army Air Corps. Uh, next slide. So Stan went to, uh, he was sent down to South Carolina to, uh, to pursue uh, pilot training. This is him on one of the first uh, aircraft that he flew. Uh, and his, he made his way um, through the process. But of course, the cadets were not the ones who got to ultimately decide what type of aircraft uh, they would get to fly in combat, assuming they made it through the course. That was that was the Army's decision. And in Stan's case, uh, the decision was made to route him to uh, bombers, to the B-25 bomber in particular. Uh, next one. This is actually a combat photo taken by one of uh, Stan's, um, uh, another crewman on one of Stan's uh, flights. Um, he was assigned to a really fascinating uh, bombardment group, the 345th Bombardment Group, and he was sent to the Pacific where he flew uh, over 40 combat missions against the Japanese. And the 345th specialized in a really uh, interesting kind of low altitude um, attacks on Japanese shipping. They would usually attack even lower than this, uh, right above the waterline, and they would actually drop uh, their bombs and skip them across the water like uh, skipping stones on a pond with the goal of slamming the bomb into the side of the ship where it would then sink and explode right below the waterline. And in the process, the goal, of course, was to uh, was to sink the ship. Uh, as well, it had uh, a dozen forward firing 50 caliber machine guns, which they used to basically attack anything on the decks uh, of those ships. Stan kept up with his art uh, during his time in the military. That middle uh, sketch is a is a self portrait, of course. Um, the one on the uh, on on I guess you're right, uh, was inspired by his time in the Philippines. Um, and again, just seeing the kind of the, the variety of, of, of uh, kind of art pursuits that, uh, that Stan um, was passionate about. So Stan, when the fighting was over, Stan decided to stay in uh, a short while longer. He wanted to make captain, which he ultimately did, but also uh, he wanted to participate in the a creation of a squadron a memory book, which actually is uh, this book right here. Um, and so Stan sketched, uh, it's kind of fascinating, that's actually, that's him drawing a panel that's in this book that introduced his particular squadron. That bombardment group had four squadrons, and that was for his, the Rough Raiders. Um, Stan also wrote uh, three or four essays in the book, which provide kind of fascinating insight into sort of his mindset at the time and how he felt about combat and how he felt about the adjustment from uh, military service going back into civilian life. I'm going to come back to this letter at the end. But so basically, after Stan came back to the States, um, Stan had gone to college before he went into the service. He graduated in 1943 uh, and then uh, went into the Army uh, right after that. Um, and so when he came back, he decided to get a master's degree on the GI Bill, and he went to UCLA. And um, while he was there, he became fascinated by what was going on in what was then known as Palestine and realized that, um, that Jewish independence was looming, that the British were going to leave uh, in the spring of 1948, on May 15th to be exact. And it was clear that there was going to be a war, and it was clear to Stan that they would need um, pilots. Uh, to participate in that war and the the local jews were unlikely to have trained uh, pilots who could fly uh, modern aircraft and so he made the decision to uh, go to israel and uh, join the air force at the time what that meant was so basically with war looming at the initiative of the united states an arms embargo was declared on all of the uh, on all of the parties in the region which disproportionately affected the Jews because the Jews had not been able to bring in uh, the weapons of, um, of a modern air force, a modern Navy, a modern 
uh, armored corps while the British were there, whereas uh, Egypt, Jordan uh, were under no such limitations and they actually had proper uh, military forces. So the only country that was willing to openly, well, not openly, but that was willing to break the embargo was what was then known as Czechoslovakia um, with, with uh, Joseph Stalin's uh, approval. Uh, they agreed to sell the Jews uh, Messerschmitts. These were planes that had been built uh, in a, a production line that the Nazis had put in Czechoslovakia uh, near the end of the war to try to disperse their uh, production so as to try to uh, save it from Allied air attacks. And so the Czechs, after the war, inherited the production line, continued to make uh, the planes, but because of a fire, had to put in uh, a non, uh, an engine that was really not the proper engine for the plane, uh, which uh, made it a very, very dangerous uh, one to fly. But so the, the new volunteers were sent first to Czechoslovakia to get uh, conversion training on these Messerschmitts before making their way to Israel. Now, Stan uh, went uh, not by himself. The, Stan is the shorter one in this picture. The taller man is a guy named Bob Vickman. Uh, both Stan and Bob were uh, highly assimilated, um, highly assimilated Jews. Uh, neither one was bar mitzvahed, and according to both of their families, neither one ever set a foot in a synagogue in their entire lives. Um, but they became uh, great friends at UCLA, and they may, and uh, Bob also had been a pilot. Uh, during World War II. In his case, he had flown uh, the P-38 Lightning, a reconnaissance version of it in the Pacific. And they had both entered World War II with the goal of becoming fighter pilots. Both had become close, but uh, neither one had made it. And so for them, this was a chance to go to Israel to help the Jews get their state, but also it was a chance to become, uh, to, to realize uh, this fighter pilot dream that they both, uh, that they both shared. So this is them in Czechoslovakia uh, during this training period. So basically, they make it to Israel, um, and this is Stan uh, standing in front of one of these uh, Messerschmitts, ME-109s, um, and they were assigned to what was then uh, known as the 101 Squadron, which was the only uh, fighter squadron for the duration uh, of the war. And um, is that the next one? And so, so, so early on, Stan's artistic skills were put to use uh, in Israel. Um, the pilots wanted a logo for this uh, for this new squadron, and this is what uh, this is what Stan came up with. Uh, it's at the suggestion of one of the other volunteers. This is an angel of death uh, because the Egyptians were the most feared uh, adversary of the Israelis at that time, and so it was thought fitting that uh, once again the angel of death would 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 wreak vengeance on the uh, on the Egyptian. Uh, uh, persecutors of the Jewish people, and of course the logo was 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 put on the planes. This is uh, a message from it uh, from the Israel Air Force Museum in Beersheba. So the the war the War of Independence was Israel's longest war. It went on for slightly more than a year, uh, but it was it was interrupted by um, by three or four fairly extended truce periods, and during those truce periods. Uh, the UN positioned um, dozens of inspectors uh, in Israel to try to prevent Israel from bringing in uh, more weapons, uh, more volunteers. Um, and Israel continued to smuggle in weapons and continued to bring in volunteers during the truce periods. And, and, and the goal for, uh, for the uh, Israeli army was to shield that activity from the inspectors. And so Israel needed a... Uh, an Air Force representative to essentially be the country's representative to the UN to deal with these inspectors, uh, to try to basically cooperate with them where possible, but also to keep them away from uh, the principal airfields where, where the most important smuggling was taking place. And Stan was given that, uh, that role. And one of the types of aircraft that was smuggled in during the period that Stan was acting as liaison was a uh, uh, were the Bristol Bow Fighters. Uh, Israel bought uh, five of them as war surplus uh, in England, and then basically using uh, as a, they used a dummy corporation to buy the planes, and then created a um, and then created a basically a, a pretext that they were filming a movie about New Zealand bow fighter pilots during the Second World War. And uh, this is actually that picture on the right is 
is a picture of filming beginning uh, on what was supposed to have been the first day of the movie project. Uh, the planes took off and uh, did not land, uh, continued on uh, to Czechoslovakia and then on to um, and then on to Israel, where they became uh, part of what was then known as the 103 Squadron. And that the the image on the left is a political cartoon uh, from the time about the disappearance of uh, of these bow fighters. And so one of Stan's responsibilities was to shield this type of activity uh, from the UN. So basically, with the truce coming to a close and the fighting poised to resume, Stan wanted to go back into combat. By this point in the war, um, there was no longer a place for him in the one-on-one -on -one squadron. Um, he was a converted bomber pilot. And after a, a couple of months, the 101 squadron was actually flush with with real fighter pilots with with extensive experience people like for example chris mcgee who <clears throat> who had i think nine and a half kills uh, as a member of the black sheep squadron in world war ii and there were some uh several canadians also who were uh, aces on uh, on malta and so he decided to go to the 103 squadron where the bow fighters were and the bow fighter was a plane very much like the um, like the B twenty five that he had flown in World War II that also had been used uh, in low altitude attacks, and so that seemed to be the most sensible place for him to go. And that's uh, that's an image of uh, one of these bow fighters uh, uh, in its uh, in, it, in its uh, markings. Um, so basically, this last phase of the war the goal was to relieve the isolation there were a bunch of jewish settlements in the negev that were um that were cut off from the rest of israel the egyptians occupied a, a band of territory that became known as the isolation belt and israel needed to break through the isolation belt in order to be able to relieve these settlements and there was a fear that if israel did not break through that in a post-war uh, settlement, Israel would lose uh, part of the Negev. Um, central to capturing or breaking through the isolation belt was uh, taking this particular fortress. Um, those of you who have driven from Tel Aviv to Jerusalem may have noticed on a hilltop a fortress very much like this one. These were built in the 1920s at the suggestion of a British anti-terrorism uh, expert uh, in response to um, an Arab uprising. And the goal was to basically put these on the high ground. These had courts, jails, administrative offices to basically try to uh, protect um, uh, British, uh, kind of the British uh, government uh, forces in the country. This particular one, uh, also on high ground uh, in the Negev, uh, became known as the monster on the hill and uh, was occupied uh, by, the, uh, by the Egyptians. And so the decision was made, there had been, I think, seven or eight attempts, failed attempts uh, to capture it, uh, to send uh, two bow fighters from the 103, from the 103 squadron uh, to attack it, and then to follow that up with an infantry assault. So basically, uh, there were two other uh, uh, crewmen on, on, on Stan's flight, and they attacked, uh, dropped uh, bombs, and then came around to make a second pass. And on the second pass, they were hit and crashed uh, several miles away uh, in the desert behind Egyptian lines. Um, and this is uh, the wreckage after it had been burning for, uh, for several hours. Um, next slide. So this is, uh, this is my brother, Craig. He's pointing. So this was, this was an Arab village at that time. And the plane would have come down uh, probably less than a mile away from this village. It would have come in low, trailing smoke, and crashed out there uh, in these sand dunes. Uh, next slide. And you can see that's um, you can see those sand dunes. They they are they're still there, very much like they were uh, in in forty eight. Um, and that is uh, that's Ashdod, and um, and so the plane crashed out there. And next slide. So where the plane crashed is actually now a neighborhood. Um, and that's actually the, the precise spot uh, where it came down. And what's interesting is that wreckage that we saw a few slides ago, uh, Israel just left it there. And 
over time, the sand uh, covered it and uh, it was forgotten about. Um, the area actually got a nickname, um, Givata Matos, Airplane Hill, uh, which people weren't sure why they called it that, but uh, that's what they called it. And then when they were building this neighborhood, a, a bulldozer uh, hit the wreckage. And uh, and so they excavated it. And um, among other things, uh, the guy who was called in to identify the plane uh, told me that uh, he was shocked to discover that the uh, Jewish star emblem on the plane had somehow survived uh, all that it had been through. What's the I, I believe it's Ashdod. Uh, next slide. So this is um, this is on Mount Herzl, which is uh, Israel's uh, Arlington. Um, this is called the Garden of the Missing. And these are all uh, soldiers whose remains have never been recovered. Um, and these are symbolic headstones uh, for each of them. And uh, next slide. Um, and that is the one uh, for Stan. Um, let's see, next one. So one of the things that uh, we were delighted to discover is that uh, Stan's logo has survived. There is still a 101 squadron. They now have more than one fighter squadron, but there is still a 101, which is sometimes referred to as the first fighter squadron. And they've kept Stan's logo. You can see that they've updated it, but they also have the original on there as well. And I'm told that that is the only logo in the entire Israeli military that depicts a human form. Um, and uh, it was such a beloved logo that they were allowed to essentially keep it, um, even though it did not meet with uh, uh, the rule that otherwise applies to all the other units. Um, next one. And the next one. So now to the letter. So one of the things that we were most curious about when we started our research was, was why did Stan go? Um, you know, as an assimilated Jew, someone who had changed his name, uh, he was in a, a very committed relationship with a non-Jewish woman that seemed destined for, for marriage. You know, why, why did he, of all people, uh, decide to, uh, to go to Israel and become part of this struggle? And so um, it took us, you know, we finished the first book in 1998, and it took us literally, I think, about nine years before we found his family. Um, because that name... <clears throat> We hadn't been aware originally that he had changed his name and that name Andrews was not one that we could search and his family had not stayed connected to the volunteer uh, community. Uh, so it took quite a while to find them. And uh, when we did find them, uh, we also were able to track down uh, his two best friends from that time who were still around, uh, high school friends, college friends, World War II squadron mates and so on. And one of his best friends had retained uh, this letter in which Stan explained why he was going. And uh, I'll just read briefly from it. I won't go into all of my reasons, but I assure you I've thought about it for some time. As you know, I'm just as cynical, cold-blooded, practical, and mercenary as you think you are. In this particular case, however, I must confess to a certain amount of idealism. Personally, I don't give a damn about Zionism. Theoretically, as a matter of fact, I think it's harmful. I'd rather see Jews assimilate into all nations rather than setting up a separate racial culture. So it's not for that reason that I'd be sticking my neck out. Briefly, it's this. For some time, since I entered the army, in fact, I've been increasingly troubled about anti-Semitism and the problems of being a Jew, no matter how atheistic, in a Christian world. Not being religious, I'd never considered myself a Jew, except by accident. I find, however, that the label is forced on me, whether I like it or not. And now, out of perversity, perhaps, I refuse to discard it, even if I have a chance, which I definitely do, not looking, talking, or acting what is popularly conceived as being Jewish. Merely admitting or even proclaiming loudly one's, Jewish, one's Jewishness these days is not enough, however. For one of the few times in history, there seems to be a definite opportunity to get in a few licks in the fight. The Jew has always been known as an intellectual, not a fighter, a turner of cheeks, a beggar for help against oppression, always the victim, never the victor. Every time there is an outbreak of anti-Semitism, a pogrom, an organized campaign of extinction, what have the Jews done? Passed resolutions, sent petitions, wrote letters, made speeches, and never fought. That can be pretty frustrating and a hell of a label to carry on with you. If then we can fight back just once, I intend to do it. I don't care what the politics are in this case, though they're pretty right, actually. I just want to walk off, work off some of the endless frustration and nervous tension of hearing little flicks of anti-Semitism every day. Just little remarks that you can't poke a guy for, but have to smile and take or pretend you didn't hear. 
I'm tired of hearing guys talk of chewing someone down, of Hebe, Jew boy, or even the ones who magnanimously proclaim that some of their best friends are Jews. I'd like to be associated with the only Jews who have ever made a name for themselves as fighters rather than talkers and book writers, although I want to be a book writer too. When these guys get through, when you hear the word Jew mentioned, you'll think of something else besides a pawnbroker or a shopkeeper. Um, I, I think the letter kind of, you know, sort of says it all in terms of, 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 of what he was thinking at the time. We also tracked down a bunch of essays that he wrote uh, in a UCLA uh, writing class that he took. And, um, and several of them were, were centered on the theme of anti-Semitism. And it was clearly a, a major focus for him. But I, I, I think we both particularly loved that last line. When you hear the word Jew, you'll think of something other. When these guys get through, you'll think of something else other than a shopkeeper or a pawnbroker. I mean, who today would, would, would think, would make that association? And yet that was an association at the time. Um, and certainly today, when, when, you know, hearing the word uh, uh, Israeli or Israeli soldier, you would have a very, very different uh, impression. And, um, and I think that uh, Stan, to his uh, immense credit, uh, uh, helped change that image. Uh, thank you very much. Oh, sure. What was the date of letter? It was uh, March of 1948. Yeah, I th I mean, at the time in 1948, I think there wasn't as much known about about Sobibor and places like that where there were uprisings. Um, but he talks about, you know, what have the Jews done? They haven't ever fought. They they sent petitions. They they make speeches, that kind of thing. So I, I think he's referencing the his perception that the Jews didn't resist during the Holocaust and that that was something that weighed on him. Um, he sent a similar letter to his uh, older brother, um, that has a lot of the same themes in it. Um, and there also talks about his, his feeling that, that the Jews had been betrayed by the U S, um, which seems correct, which seems to be a reference to, um, uh, the state department, uh, seeming, uh, seeming to be poised to renege on support for partition, um, but uh, but he doesn't mention the Holocaust by name, but I think it's there implicitly. There were, at one point in the war, uh, three B-17s were smuggled out of the U.S. to Israel. And uh, one of the men who flew uh, one of those planes, a guy named, uh, I think, Charlie Winter, actually was prosecuted after the war and I think sat in jail for about a year. Uh, he was pardoned. I believe by George W. Bush near the end of his uh, presidency. Um, Al Schwimmer was one of the more famous volunteers. Um, he later, uh, I think, helped found Israel Aircraft Industries. One of the reasons why he did that was because he had no future in the U.S. Um, aircraft industry because he was prosecuted after the war as well and convicted. He didn't go to jail, but um, but that conviction uh, basically uh, ended his career uh, in aviation uh, in this country. So there were some prosecutions, but only one person uh, actually went to prison. But there was a lot of fear about it. Stan actually, when he was uh, in that role as liaison, some of the folks that he was dealing with, some of the truce inspectors were actually Americans. And so he was very concerned that they would discover his identity and he used an assumed name, uh, Andre Stanek, uh, when he served in that capacity so as to uh, basically try to protect himself from some kind of post-war prosecution. I think in general, it was a horrible experience for the family, not just losing him. I think I th part of the problem was that uh, Israel did not do a good job of notifying the families uh, of, of volunteers when something like this happened, of keeping them informed. And so uh, Stan's sister, Esther, took on much of the burden of communicating with um with Israel and she she was furious with what she perceived to be uh, neglect on Israel's part in updating the family with information that it was extraordinarily painful that um that he was uh, that his remains were never recovered um it wasn't until the spring of 49 that POWs were returned uh from Egypt and um, there was hope, of course, that he would be uh, among them, but uh, but he was not. It does seem that he likely survived the crash, um, that all of them likely survived the crash and were murdered somewhere else. And actually, one body was recovered, but it was uh, identified as belonging to a different crewman, Len Fitchett. 
but the other two were likely taken somewhere else and killed. I, for me, I, I've, I've for a long time really loved Israel's history, Israel's military history in particular. Um, and having learned Hebrew in my twenties, I, I, I took to reading, um, basically Israeli military history in Hebrew to keep my, my language skills fresh. And, uh, in 1995, I read a book, uh, called, uh, Alone in the Sky by a guy named Danny Shapira, uh, Levad Bishakim. And, uh, and it was, he was, um, he was a young cadet during the war of independence. He later became Israel's chief test pilot. He was the one who flew, uh, the MiG 21 that an Iraqi defected to Israel in, in 1965. Um, and, uh, so he has a great, he had a, he had a great story to tell, but he talked about all of these North Americans and South Africans who were volunteers and who really dominated the air force. And it was a story that I really didn't know. And I thought, wow, if there's, if there really is a story here, this would be the time to write it and have it come out in 1998, Israel's 50th anniversary. In 1995, we had books coming out for the 50th anniversary of World War II. And so, um, so my brother, I drafted my brother, Craig, who was in Israel at the time. And uh, together, we interviewed about 120 of the volunteers, uh, tracked down maybe another 100 or so uh, transcripts of interviews that have been done in the past that were still in various archives. And um, yeah, I mean, for us, it was just a labor of love. It was something that really fascinated us and continues to fascinate us. That covers basically kind of the, it, it goes through the war and as seen through the eyes of this, of this big group of, of Americans and Canadians who fought. Yeah. I mean, there was, they were an amazing group. There were some wonderful stories in there, but for, for a variety of reasons, Stan was the one who most tugged at our heartstrings. Just he had so much talent, he had so much promise, he had so much life ahead of him still, and he was such an unlikely volunteer, and um, and he was so articulate. I mean, those letters, the one uh, that I read from, the one to his brother, were extraordinary just in terms of explaining his motivations. Um, and his goal in going there in part was to write a book about it. Um, so there's a lot of poignancy, I think, to his... The Messerschmitts, what they basically did was they dis they partially disassembled them and they put them in the backs of C-46s. That's actually how Stan got to Israel, was in the back of a C-46 sitting with, with half of a Messerschmitt. Um, and then they reassembled them once they got to Israel. The planes were 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 didn't perform well because of the engine switch, but uh, but they weren't they weren't junk. Um there was some salvaging of there was some salvaging of planes uh that the British had left behind. Uh, but, um, but yeah, and then much later they bought uh, a bunch of, uh, Spitfires from the Czechs and flew those to Israel. Um, but that came later in the war. I guess I, I guess I'd answer it this way. I, th I think it's fair to say that, that, and, and I think by the way, when Sans, when Stan says, I don't give a damn about Zionism, I think what he's saying is. I think what he's referring to is like, I'm not a Zionist in the sense of like Zionist youth movement types who dream about going to Israel and, you know, living on a kibbutz and they're singing songs and they want to farm the land. I, I think that's what he's kind of dismissing. And I think a lot of the volunteers had sort of no interest in that. They were not classic Zionists. I think there were very few who really were idealistic about wanting to create a Jewish state and to be part of that Jewish state. Although some of course did stay. Um, but I think they just felt a deep sense of obligation. They There was a, a, a genuine fear that there would be a second Holocaust. Um, there were 600,000 Jews uh, there at the time and and uh, a great many folks thought that they'd be wiped, uh, they'd be wiped off the map. Um, so I think there was a great sense that they wanted to go and, and, um, and help prevent that. I think for some as well, you know, there was, there was a sense that, uh, you know, they missed the adventure of World War II. Maybe their post-war lives hadn't quite settled into anything that was satisfying to them. I mean, I, th I think there was a wide variety of motivations, but I think very few were, were sort of truly idealistic Zionists in the, in the sense that, that we might think. He did. He did. Yeah. He flew two missions, two missions. Cause he got there right before uh, the first round of fighting. And then, um, and then, and then there was a truce. Then, 
And then he was involved in a crash in his first mission during the second round of fighting and, um, and didn't get back into the air uh, as a fighter pilot, didn't get back until he went over to the uh, bomber squadron. Uh, about a thousand in total went over there and probably the overwhelming majority were Jewish, but there were some significant contributions by non-Jews um, and some really fascinating non-Jews went over there. One of the one of the fighter pilots uh, was Slick Goodland, who was the X-1 test pilot before Chuck Yeager. Um, some of the Canadian volunteers um, were these Malta aces. Um, in fact, the leading aces of the war, there was an American, a guy named Rudy Argotten, uh, who was a Harvard grad. And then there was a Canadian uh, named uh, Jack Doyle, and they each had four kills during the war. Um, and uh, Doyle was not was not Jewish. Um, so you had Doyle, you had Danny Wilson, and uh, uh, and uh, John McElroy, who were all terrific pilots. I think each of them had at least three kills uh, flying for Israel. None of them were Jewish. Um, so there were so the non Jews actually made quite an impact, but I think overwhelmingly the volunteers were Jewish. Nobody was prosecuted for going and fighting. The only prosecutions had to deal with weapon smuggling. Those C-46s that were used to, to ferry the aircraft from Czechoslovakia, those were smuggled out of the U.S. They were purchased, then there was a, a presidential proclamation that, that prevented them from being taken out of the country and they were flown out uh, in violation of the law. And so, um, so they were prosecuted for that. Yes, of course. Yeah, he was also in the 101 Squadron. Yeah, we interviewed him for the first book, A Great Guy. He passed away not that long ago, actually. I believe he won the Navy Cross, if I'm not mistaken. Um, I do think he wanted to go to Europe. Um, I, th I don't think that that motivated his actions. But what I do think played a, a significant role was the fact that he, he wasn't able to become a fighter pilot. And so for him, that was, that was a dream that had not been fulfilled. I think when he went to Israel, you know, he had three or four different motivations. Um, Anti-Semitism was a huge focus for him. It's, it's all over his college essays. Um, and it's, it's in those letters, um, in both of them. Uh, but he also, I think, wanted to be a fighter pilot and this was a chance and he wanted to be a writer and, realized that uh, he and and Bob, who was also an artist, were going to have a front row seat for this history, and they wanted to record it. They actually built a box and and loaded it with typewriters and uh, still camera, movie camera, art supplies, all sorts of things, because they wanted to record the war. Bob was also uh, killed in the war. Um, he disappeared uh, during... Uh, uh, on the mission where where Stan was uh, where Stan was involved in that crash, Bob Bob disappeared on that mission, um, and one of Stan's goals in staying was to try to figure out what had happened to uh, to Bob, and he leveraged his uh, contacts uh, throughout the Israeli military establishment when he was acting as liaison to try to track down information. Uh, in the end, of course, neither one of them was ever returned. There were two different paths for volunteers to become involved. You had people like Stan who decided, I want to be part of this. And they searched for a way to uh, make contact with recruiters. Um, and, and the Haganah had set something up called Land and Labor for Palestine, which was a front group uh, to shield the recruiting of soldiers. Um, Stan actually tracked down Ben Hecht, of all people, the screenwriter, and uh, through him somehow got an introduction. And then he and Bob went uh, and met with, uh, they had a physical in Los Angeles and they were sent to New York. Um, and the Haganah had set up in, in the Hotel 60, which is where the um, Copacabana was. Um, and, and that's where they uh, made contact. And then they were sent over to, uh, to Europe and then on to uh, Czechoslovakia for training. There were others who were recruited where, you know, they go through pilot lists, look for people with Jewish names and then just reach out to them and see if they were interested in flying. So they were sort of both kinds, but in Stan and Bob's case, uh, they sought out the opportunity rather than the other way around. Uh, sure, and she was saying that uh, she was in Jerusalem at the time of, of in the siege. So basically Jerusalem was a besieged city uh, uh, during the first part of the war until um, a bypass road was, uh, was uh, constructed, the Burma Road. Um, 
and uh, and um, and she was saying, and she served in the army uh, ten years later, uh, and they were still using uh, Czech uh, Czech arms, uh, which is uh, which is remarkable. I did not know that. Incredible. Thanks. Uh, I, sounds like that's it. Thank you very much.